Thank you for the introduction. And thank you all for joining today. Photometry and cell sorting are growing areas in research. My hope with this seminar is to provide a basic overview of flow cytometry and some key areas to consider when adapting this technology to your single cell research. I'll focus on a high level overview of flow cytometry and cell sorting. We'll talk a bit about instrumentation and setup, sample preparation, and then some basic cell sorting applications to which this technology can be applied. While there are several methods available using magnetic beads and microfluidics, for the purposes of this talk and in the interest of time, I'll focus on cell sorting using the electrostatic droplet method. Flow cytometry is the measurement of cell properties while flowing in a single cell suspension, and that single cell suspension is really key. Some of you may have used a cell analyzer or cell sorter before. A cell analyzer collects data from each cell for analysis only, so it provides you the data, whereas a cell sorter does that and takes it to the next level. It lets you separate the cells of interest based on that analysis. As you can see in the diagram to the right, this really starts with a single cell suspension, which is focused into a stream and then interrogated by one or more laser beams. Single cell suspension is in a carrier fluid, which is called the sheath, this presents the cell to that interrogation point, and that's where the lasers hit the cells in the stream of fluid passing by. From there, we collect light coming from each cell, separate by wavelength, and digitize for processing and display to the user. This is where the analyzer ends and the sorting picks up. For an electrostatic droplet sorter, we use a crystal in the nozzle, which vibrates the stream and causes droplets to break off. If a population is identified for sorting, the system waits until that cell is in the last attached droplet, where it is charged positively or negatively, and then moves through an electric field and is deflected into the collection vessel below. This can be test tubes, microtiter plates, or other media. I suggest you always use the suggested QC procedures to ensure your sorter and analyzer are working properly before running your samples. So what happens when the laser beams hit the cells in the stream? A key aspect of flow cytometry is the generation and collection of light. As each cell or particle passes through the laser beam or beams, it causes the light to emit in all directions. There are really two types of light that we look at. One is scattered, and you'll see that on the left-hand side of this slide. Anything passing through the laser beam scatters light. So any particles, background, debris, or the cells we're looking for. We look at scattered light in two ways, both in the forward direction and the side direction. The forward direction gives us an indication of relative size of the cell, whereas the side direction gives us some information on the internal complexity. Some systems exist where you can see more than one wavelength of light with the scatter as well, if you're looking at small particles or alternate wavelengths. Now the fluorescence is a whole other side of the light we look at, and that is demonstrated in the image on the right. What happens is the laser light excites fluorophores or any tags that you've added to your cell suspension, absorbs that light, and then emits in a longer wavelength. That's called a Stokes shift. It's a longer wavelength. And then we collect that light, that longer light, and we can tell what fluorescent molecules were on the surface of the cell when they were excited. We can mark internal and external components of cells. So how do we label cells? Well, again, as we come back to the single cell suspension, it's really important and that's key. And by using that, then we add antigens, antibodies, or different dyes and stains to mark the cells of interest. This can also be fluorescent proteins within the cell already or autofluorescence of cells. Now, an antibody added to the cell suspension can be tagged with what we call a fluorophore. This is what absorbs the laser light and then emits the fluorescent light. Antigen abundance and fluorophore selection are really important things to consider when designing your experiment. Not only does it need to align with the instrument you're using and the lasers available, but also focused with the cell type that you're interested in. 
their viability dies as well. And this is really important to make sure you're only considering the live cells and eliminating the dead cells if you're sorting for that purpose. We can also look at DNA content as well, like I mentioned, the fluorescent proteins. Many of these options can be used on the same cell. So therefore cells can emit many, many different wavelengths. And then those have to be separated to identify the populations of interest. So how do we separate that light? We use optical filters. Optical filters are just coated pieces of glass that can separate the light into the different wavelengths and steer it to the detectors. So we have four main types of filters in flow cytometry. There are a few others. These are the four ones you'll hear most. A dichroic long pass, which lets some light pass through and reflects others. A dichroic short pass, which lets the shorter light pass through and reflects the others. A band pass, which lets a specific band of light come through. And then neutral density, which just generally dims everything down, kind of like sunglasses for that signal. The same process of filtering and bouncing light is used for both scattered and fluorescent light sources. And these filters direct the light directly to the detectors for amplification and processing of that light. So what happens once the light's been separated? I said it goes to the detectors, which can be PMTs, photomultiplier tubes, photodiodes, or other types of up and coming detectors. What those detectors do is amplify the light and send it to the electronics for processing. So the electronics take that signal coming from the detector and process in several different ways. We, first of all, have to set a threshold. And this threshold level, as you can see in the diagram on the right, shows the level that a particle needs to exceed in order for it to be important. So we're trying to eliminate any baseline or background noise or particles or debris from the assessment. Once it passes that threshold, we measure other properties of the cell or the pulse, the height, how high it is, the intensity, the area under the curve of that cell pulse and the width of it. These measurements give us a lot of information about every single cell, both the scattered and fluorescent light. For example, in this case, if we were to look at it, the scattered light would give us an idea of cell shape or size again, and the side scatter shape. A large fluorescent pulse may point to abundance of that marker on the cell surface or perhaps the protein expression. So it's very much relative to other particles that are in the suspension. This process takes place for every detector on every cell that crosses that threshold. So a system with say seven lasers and 50 detectors would provide over 1000 different measurements for each cell that passes through the laser beam. And we can run at different event rates. You can run at hundreds, thousands, even tens of thousands events per second, so cells per second. So the amount of assessment we're doing on every cell is massive. So how, how do you boil that down to actually see what you want? This is where just data visualization comes in. So every cell sorter comes with a computer and software package which displays the data to the user for analysis and assessment. These files are called FCS files, flow cytometry standards, and there are a variety of offline software packages available, which give you the ability to read and process these files for advanced features. But basically, the data is displayed in plots, histograms and density plots, some of which are shown here on the screen. In these plots, the user can select which parameter they'd like to see on each axis, and which measurement, the pulse, the width, the area, etc. Regions and gates are used, which you can see again in these diagrams, ellipses, polygons, bar regions, to identify the populations of interest and gather more information. I could spend multiple webinars just on the different aspects of data visualization, but that's not the purpose here. Um, so suffice it to say, there's a lot to identifying which cell populations are desired for sorting, including running proper controls and compensating for overlapping spectra. Once you know what you want to sort, you can create regions and decide on the experimental needs for purity and recovery, among other things. So now that you've identified what to sort, how do you know it will be sorted properly? 
The key to this is timing, or one of the keys. That timing is called drop delay. Drop delay is the timing between when the lasers hit the cell of interest and that cell moves down the stream to the last detached droplet. As we talked about, remember, there's a crystal in the nozzle that vibrates, causing those droplets to break off at a very steady rate. So getting that timing right is really key to sorting the right cell at the right time. There are different methods for this. One of those is adjusting beads, which are small part plastic particles, and adjusting the timing while watching for sorted events. That's the diagram you can see on the right here. On the x-axis, we have drop delay timing, and on the y-axis, intensity of what we're seeing. We adjust the timing and we look for the intensity of the events to increase. This means we're nearing the optimal drop delay. We continue past that to make sure we found the true peak and therefore the most accurate drop delay timing setting we can. This is so critical as if you're off by just half a droplet, it can give you no cells back or very minimal or the wrong cells, maybe even worse. So this is really, really a key part for cell sorting this way. So how do we sort from there? Once we've calculated that timing, we have to know which direction you're going to sort and how. So what we do is we apply a charge to that last attached drop that we've just accurately timed. We let that droplet break off from the rest of the stream. And then that droplet goes through an electrostatic plates for deflection, we call them deflection plates. So the negatively charged cells will move towards the positive and the positive towards the negative. And then it directs them into whatever sort collection vessel we have below. We also catch the waste, which can be decontaminated safely in the future. So different instruments can sort at different speeds, and different number of populations into different collection vessels. Really the world is your oyster with this. One of the key factors is the speed of droplet creation. Some instruments you can create 30,000 droplets a second, some 90,000 or 100,000 droplets a second. So this will really dictate how fast and how quickly you can sort the cells. We talked earlier that you can run hundreds, thousands, or even tens of thousands of cells per second. So that combined with your droplets per second will give you your limiting sort rate. It's also highly dependent on the electronics for the instrument. Again, if we're measuring over a thousand things per cell and we're running at a thousand events per second, for example, you've got a lot of data coming through there and a lot of decisions to make really quickly in order to sort the right thing. So you have to ensure your electronics can keep up with the sort rate prescribed for your experiment. Some instruments can sort different ways, two, four, even six ways into five ml test tubes. There are other collection vessels as well. Some people sort into micro titer plates directly, and this is a key for single cell sorting. You can sort into 96 or 384 well plates very accurately and have exactly one cell per well, which you can do further downstream processing. You can sort into slides, into Petri dishes, PCR strips, anything that you can think of and put underneath there, we can sort into downstream processing. So once you've set the timing properly, how do you know what's gonna get sorted and what's not? And in all cell sorting experiments, there's a balance between the purity of the sorted sample and the quantity of cells recovered. Sort modes allow us to adjust this balance. There's an enrichment sort mode, and these sort modes are pretty consistent from instrument to instrument. They'll have very similar modes. An enrichment mode sorts everything that's positive, everything that's past your regions and gates, even if there's something negative present. This means you'll get every cell back that you want, so your recovery will be high, but your purity may suffer. And from the diagram on the right, you'll see the enrichment, all the droplets labeled with the green arrow would sort. Therefore, you will have some contamination. Now in purity mode, that's the most commonly used. It sorts everything positive as long as there's nothing negative there. So again, in the diagram to the right, you'll see those are labeled by the purple arrows. So that would sort those three droplets and not sort the ones with the contaminating events. This keeps recovery reasonably high, but really improves your purity as you're not planning to sort anything negative. Another mode we have is single mode. Single mode is meant for when you wanna sort one and only one cell, and you don't even want multiple positive cells in a droplet. 
This is when you're commonly used for cloning and sequencing applications where the placement of that one and only one cell is critical to any downstream processing. Your purity is really high for this. You're getting exactly what you want, but your recovery can be low. So you could be throwing away some cells that you want. Some systems have additional options where you can adjust the window used to make that sorting decision, the droplet envelope, the number of drops we're sorting, or even collect aborts in a different tube. That's called mixed mode on a lot of instruments where we can sort at a high purity in one direction and collect the aborts in another direction. This allows you to have a really good balance between both purity and recovery. Let's switch gears a little bit and talk about sample preparation. This is really key to cell sorting. No matter the instrument you're using for sorting, there are a number of basic guidelines, so some of which are listed here. Let's go through those. As we talked before, single cell suspension is really, really important. Remember, we're pushing the sample through a nozzle or a small orifice, depending on the system, and if we have clumps of cells, that will clog that orifice. Clogging is something that happens with cell sorting, but we'd like to avoid it as much as possible. So as much as you can do to get a single cell suspension, the better. We also always recommend filtering samples to remove any clumps or residual um, particles from the prep. So that's always important too, again, just to maintain that single cell suspension. Consider cell size and system setup when you're prepping your samples. Think about your nozzle size, think about your pressure. Do you have really fragile cells that you're, pre you're sorting that are very sensitive to pressure? Do you have more flexible cells than, they, than they're fixed so you can go faster and you can treat them a little more harshly? Keep that in mind, very important. And with panel development, again, that's a whole other area for discussion. I'm sure many of you have seen webinars on that as well. But that's an important element to this as well, like the complexity of the panel that you're using on your cell sorter. Many cell analyzers can look at more information around a cell, and when you get to a sort, you want to try to trim that back to the critical features. When you're also designing a panel, you want to consider titrating your antibodies. You have to identify which amount of antibody is needed to give you the best position between your positive and negative populations. In the little histogram on the lower right of this screen, you can see a titration experiment and each of those showing different concentrations of antibody added so you can find the maximum separation between the negative and positive cells. I always recommend including a viability dye if you're working with live cells. Like I mentioned previously, it's really key to ensuring that you're getting the cells you want and those are alive if that's what you're looking for. Always you need controls. We're all scientists and for any experiment you need controls. So make sure you have the proper controls for any analysis or sorting experiment. This can include single color controls to ensure your staining and prep went properly, negative control to look at background autofluorescence, and even fluorescence minus one controls if you have any concerns of overlapping populations. All of these are really critical to ensuring the quality of your experiment. Another thing to do is to consider temperature control. Really, you gotta keep the cells happy through the cell sorting process. This is really key. A lot of instruments have temperature control both on the sample input side and the sort output side. Keeping the cells at a steady temperature throughout the sorting process will really help with your overall viability and recovery. If your cells like to be cold, four degrees, if they like to be warmer, you can adjust that, but keeping those cells happy. Consider this, cell sorting. We're putting a tube of single cells on an instrument. We're jetting them out through a tiny little orifice. We're hitting them with laser beams. We're shaking them to create droplets. And then we're charging those droplets and deflecting into tubes. This is putting those cells through a lot. So whatever you can do to keep them happy. And one of those things is to give them some media for cell collection, give them a swimming pool to land in. That's what I like to say. After going through all that, give them something. Um, always practice safe sorting. With cell sorting, in this method at least, we are creating droplets, which are aerosols, which are a good size for any person to breathe in. 
Aerosols can be biohazardous depending on the cell type you're running. Of course, aerosolizing anything makes it more dangerous. So always consider safe sorting, consider aerosol containment methods, aerosol evacuation systems, even biocontainment enclosures to ensure you're keeping the people safe that are doing these experiments. It's also important to keep the product safe. And so that's something you might con consider as well to make sure you don't contaminate what you're actually sorting. Some of that can be passive by just having doors in place, and some is the more aggressive airflow just to maintain that sterility inside that sample chamber. I recommend checking the ISAC guidelines. ISAC is the International Society for Analyt Analytical Cytology, and they have good guidelines for biosafety based on the type of cell that you're sorting. So let's talk a little bit about cell sorting applications. Cell sorting generates live homogenous cell populations. You can do those by bulk in the tubes, or like we've said, into microtiter plates, a single cell for downstream applications. Isolating these pure populations really can enable you to make new discoveries, and this can happen quickly too. You need to consider all the different aspects of the cell type you're sorting, so you can decide on the method of sorting to apply. Some of these applications are listed on the right from genome editing to cell therapy, protein expression studies, and more. They're even more not listed here. We have people doing chromosome analysis, marine biology studies of phytoplankton, and even identification of extracellular vesicles. So really the sky is the limit when it comes to the applications for flow cytometry. You have to know your cell, know how it likes to be treated, and know what you're looking for before starting any flow cytometry experiment. Here we have a few additional flow cytometry learning resources for you. Thermo Fisher is really focused on education and we wanna make sure you have every bit of information you need to design a panel well, to have the tools you need to sort or analyze, to create your protocol and identify the reagents needed. We even have a space for spectral flow fundamentals. So if you're just getting into flow cytometry, spectral flow cytometry is a whole new area that the science is moving towards. And we have overview and educational seminars on that. So thank you so much for your time today. I appreciate it. And I think we'll move to questions.